Th thank you very much for the, for the kind invitation and for the opportunity to speak here. So I will come up with certain statements and thesis that perhaps some of you may find a little shocking and that perhaps some of you may disagree with, but hopefully that will lead to an interesting discussion. Start with a traditional picture, which however will be abandoned or changed later on. <coughs> so what is the role or purpose of science or how can we classify sciences according to what, what they achieve? And a basic classification would be that science can either explain things or it can predict future events. It can explain the current structure, make sense of it, or it can, can tell you what might happen in the future. So let's try to look at the individual sciences, how they would fare with that classification. So here's a couple of sciences that are explanatory in that sense. So evolutionary biology, the Darwinian theory, explains the composition of current generations in terms of selective processes that have taken place in ancestral populations. It doesn't really make predictions about the future, except in, in certain general terms. Likewise, psychoanalysis tells you the reason for your mental problems by, uh, by identifying events in your infancy or childhood that, that, that may have triggered those. But again, it makes little predictions and it doesn't come up with general predictive schemes. Uh, in the humanities, you have hermeneutics, which just tries to interpret things by feeling from within how the they, they, they would make sense. The economic theory, I'm putting some question mark here because economic theory tries to explain certain things. They may also attempt to predict things, but uh, I mean, as, we, as many of you will agree, they are not always so successful in the accuracy, or in the accuracy of their predictions. The social theory, of course, one can also argue to which, in to which extent they it is even the aim to make predictions or whether they would just want to explain the structure of, of, current, of current societies or, or, or social groups. But also mathematics doesn't make predictions. It analyzes structures and in that sense it explains things, but it doesn't make predictions. And if we would go with Popper's traditional scheme that science is only what can be falsified, then you need to make predictions that can, could be qual uh, falsified, then none of this would really count as, as, as science here. Well, let's, let's come to the predictive ones. Clearly, we have physics, and physics traditionally is a role model of a science. Then, of course, in chemistry and biochemistry and molecular biology, we are currently not only trying to understand things, but we also try to make predictions about what, what would happen if we, if we mess with, 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 a, with, a, with a certain gene or if we interfere with a certain process inside the cell. Likewise, genetics on the basis of Mendel's laws makes general predictions about the genetic composition of populations. Neurobiology not only tries to understand the brain, but on the basis of that, it also tries to make predictions of uh, how it operates or will operate. And in a certain sense, in applied mathematics, if we, analyze, if we find out statistical regularities, then we make the prediction that they will persist in the future. Or if we make a simulation or scientific computation or so, then of course we also make the prediction that this will accurately predict what will happen in, in, in reality. So explanatory sciences, in a certain sense, are typically qualitative, and sometimes they are, they are normative. So they present some ideal situation. And maybe economic theory, in a certain sense, tries to describe ideal situations where you have fully rational agents and where you have completely efficient markets and everything, and how it would behave in how it would behave in that idealized situation. And then maybe there's a normative aspect that we should try to get as closely as possible to that ideal situation. Whereas the predictive sciences are typically based on empirical laws and they are making quantitative statements 
quantitative predictions. And typically, they aim for a unified theory of a vast range of empirical phenomena. And again, there is in particular the role model of physics, which achieved that to a higher and higher extent by always being able to combine hitherto disparate phenomena into something that can be explained with a unified model. So Newton, for example, explained both the planetary motions as, uh, as computed by, uh, recorded and computed by Kepler, and the laws of free fall as discovered by Galilei in terms of a unified theory. Then, of course, we have Maxwell's theory that explains magnetism and electrical phenomena and radio waves. Then we have, we have uh, several, several other theories. I guess you all know the basic features or a basic uh, aspect of the history of physics. And so that is kind of a role model. And let's look at a couple of examples. Let's look at some simple quantitative empirical laws on which good predictions, successful predictions could be based and which therefore compute prime examples for the, if you, if you talk to historians or philosophers of science, but as I will argue, they are empirically relatively rare. So let's look at those examples. I mentioned one prime example already, these are Newton's laws. They permit a closed form solution if you have two gravitating point masses, like the sun and the earth, idealized as points, and then you have an explicit exact <coughs> solution how they would move. When you have already three, then as it turned out and was first rigorously demonstrated by Poincaré that it is already no longer possible to have a closed form solution. You only can have good approximations, but with a few point masses, you can still have arbitrarily good numerical approximations to any desired degree of accuracy. But now when we go to a little smaller scale, if we no longer treat the planets as, as, as point masses, yeah, if we look at the internal compositions and so on, then things get a lot more complicated and there's no, no longer any simple such law as Newton's law if you go to a smaller scale and take the actual composition of the celestial, celestial bodies into account. Likewise, if you go to a much larger scale of large collections of point masses of galaxies or of all the stars in the galaxy or so, then Newton's laws are useless in the actual form you need to go to an entirely different, namely a statistical approach. And so the question is, why is there a particular scale in nature where Newton's laws work so beautifully, but if you go to a smaller or higher scale, why is there no such correspondingly beautiful theory? Let's look at some other examples. Uh, another prime example in physics, of course, is Schrödinger's equation. Schrödinger's equation is good for the hydrogen atom, but it becomes far too complicated for larger molecules. You can no longer solve it explicitly, and if you go to large molecules, then it even exceeds the capacities of the most advanced methods in modern scientific computing to, to, to get good solutions there. And it only holds, and it's so simple, at the atomic scale, because there's a phenomenon that's called quark confinement that you don't need to worry about what is going on inside the nucleus of the atom or what is going inside the nuclear constituents. There are the quarks and they also admit a theory but which is much more complicated and mathematically more difficult than Schrodinger's equation. But there's a phenomenon of quark confinement that tells us that, uh, that what happens with the quarks doesn't really matter if you want to understand the atom. So this is the equation. It's, uh, if you are a physicist or mathematician, you have seen it before. It just expresses uh, the wave function in a simple partial differential equation. Then, of course, if you go to physics to a smaller scale, you can ask about superstring theory. But of course, here I already put some question marks because they are not really empirical laws. Uh, they are outside the range of what, what can be tested and probed is currently available experimental techniques. 
But nevertheless, I mean, this, these are simple quantitative laws, and in principle, they are making predictions. If we go to another field, or the other fields, you have such simple laws. In biochemistry, you have the Michael is menten type reaction kinetics. So if you have two substances, S1 and S2, that can combine and produce two, two molecules of, of type P in one direction, and um, two such molecules of type P can be decomposed into their constituents, and you can describe the reaction dynamics by these simple ordinary differential equations. Again, that is quite important, basic for, for much of biochemistry, but again, that is a phenomenon that only occurs at a particular scale. If you go to a, to a lower or higher scale, then things get more complicated. And there are many intermediate stages between the Schrodinger equation, for instance, and these, these biochemical reaction kinetics, and the intermediate steps are much harder and more difficult. So one other example, the Hodgkin-Huxley equations in biophysics, originally four with some other models up to six differential equations that accurately, in a quantitative sense, even describe the quantitative aspects of the spiking dynamics of the firing of neurons. That is, was quite a substantial feat. In fact, these equations depend on many parameters, and after Hodgkin Huxley had figured out the basic structure of the equations, it took them a year or two or so to, to, to estimate to estimate all the parameters that go into this. But nevertheless, I mean, this is quantitatively extremely successful and they were rightly awarded by a Nobel Prize for achieving that. But again, this is a very rare model in biology. If you talk to historians, philosophers of science, they, they like these examples, but they usually are ignorant of the fact how, how, how rare such, uh, such good examples actually are. For other cells, you don't have such good equations as, as the Hodgkin-Huxley equation. There's also a good example from the social sciences, namely traffic dynamics can be modeled quite well with so-called quasi-physical theories. That is, you consider the agents, the human agents, essentially as physical particles and model them with tools from particle physics, gas kinetics, or fluid dynamics, and then you can make not only good qualitative models, but even come up with quantitative predictions about uh, formation of traffic jams and, and, and so on. But again, this, uh, this, uh, this is rare. This is not the, uh, one, one would like to have said in other areas of the social sciences, but this doesn't seem to be possible. So why are such good examples so, so rare? This is a question for that I'm also asking you. I don't really have a good answer for, for that question, but I want to pose that question first. But so let's see what mathematics can do, at least from the traditional picture. The traditional way was that it explored the formal structures that were derived in the individual sciences, in particular in physics. And in fact, it was not just the direction that you first had the physical theory and then you developed the mathematical tools to probe it, but often mathematical theories were created prior to their application. For example, symmetry groups, the famous Lie groups, uh, they were developed by Sophos Lee and, and, and Felix Klein in the 19th century, or the Hilbert spaces were developed prior to the application in quantum mechanics. And of course, quantum mechanics uh, depends on, on those mathematical tools. So the famous physicist Eugene Wigner calls about the unreasonable effectiveness of, of mathematics. Why, why could it be that some abstract formal structure that was concocted by some mathematicians in, in, in their desk without any relation to reality can, can then become so successful for applications in the physical sciences? Again, he posed that as a problem. Several people try to answer or address it, but still there's, there's no, no, no general consensus here. On the other hand, there are also the general methods in applied mathematics, statistical tools, methods of scientific computing, which are, which are not domain-specific. There are these tools from pure mathematics, symmetry groups or Hilbert spaces turn out to be rather, uh, ironically turn out to be rather domain-specific, whereas the many of the methods that were developed in applied mathematics are quite general and they can be applied as, as automatic tools, as perhaps many of you do in, in your everyday scientific life. 
Mm, of course, there are some predictions. Sometimes it doesn't work. Uh, some problems, sometimes it doesn't work. In the case, for example, of chaotic dynamics, no long-term prediction is possible. For example, weather forecast. Uh, essentially, the reason is uh, that there are certain chaotic phenomena going on in, 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 in the dynamics there, which makes it impossible to get accuracy for a period longer than, 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 than a few days. But this, at least at the general theoretical level, is, is well understood. Then there's the issue of reflexivity and innovations. If you apply things in the social sciences or in, in biology, then humans can anticipate the predicted, predicted effects of a theory and can react correspondingly. And also in evolutionary biology, there's a phenomenon of, a phenomenon of, of innovations which cannot be so easily predicted. So the upshot is that both humans and viruses can be cleverer than theory allows them to, to be. And there's another issue which is more technical, namely that is often not so clear to separate regularities and noise. So what should be treated as, uh, as regularity and worthy of closer investigation and what is just uh, noise, intrinsic noise or measurement noise. And if something doesn't closely follow your theory, is that just intrinsic variability? Is that an additional effect that, that you should probe? Or is it just measurement noise that you should ignore? That is not always so clear. But of course, there are also some assets. First of all, there is what is called the law of large numbers, which was essentially discovered by Jacob Bernoulli at the end of the 17th century already, namely that fluctuations average out if you look at large numbers, which is it's very powerful and that allows you, of course, to, to scale up, to ignore individual fluctuations if you come to a higher level. Then, often the essential degrees of freedom reduce. Uh, in formal terms, that is the center of manifolds here in dynamical systems. In physics, that has been called the slaving principle, in, uh, which is basic, basic for, for, for laser physics, actually, that only a few coherent modes survive and all, all the rest gets, gets suppressed. So things simplify. Yeah? And we have some structural understanding why and how this happens. Then there's higher level emergence, again connected to those two, which can also be probed with, with theoretical tools. But as I already said, the models that I have discussed above are just exceptional feeds. And if you go to higher and lower scales, such models that are so simple, that are easily analytically tractable, and that are also quantitatively accurate, are typically no longer possible. So how do we cope with, with that? And now we have to face that, that challenge. And therefore, in many fields, instead of deriving predictions from models, one seeks regularities in, in data sets. And that is something that I want to discuss with you in most of the rest of this lecture. Some examples again. In the geosciences, when you're prospecting for oil or when you want to predict earthquakes or so, you no longer have a model. You just look, estimate two-point correlators on the base of, of from noise correlations at different locations. So you, uh, you probe the noise here and you probe the noise there, and then you look what correlations do you find, and that gives you some, some estimate of, of, the, of the correlations go, uh, taking place underground. There's a drastic change from the original modeling in terms of partial differential equations, where you came up with a precise geophysical model on the basis of which you, uh, you, you try to assess things. In biology, you have the problem of protein folding. So protein is a string of amino acids, about maybe two or 300 of those typically, but it's not the string that is, uh, that, uh, is biologically active because of attractions and repulsions between the different parts and components and folds into a three-dimensional shape. And this three-dimensional shape is what is biologically relevant because it drives the physical interactions. So the question is, you have this long string, how do you predict the three-dimensional shape? Of course, you can come up with a model, a free energy function and so on, try to minimize it. All the physical principles are there, are there, but 
Some of the best minds from our profession, mathematicians and physicists, have struggled for decades of finding a theoretical solution, and they didn't succeed. Or at least the success is rather limited. But now there is an easy method there, a Google approach. You just search the where presently available extensive databases for those proteins where you know the folding structure, and then you, you, you look which is most similar to, to, the, to the string you have at hand, and that leaves you the, the best and often very accurate prediction of the three-dimensional shape of the protein that you're interested in. So somehow, for a theoretician, this, uh, this might be considered as, as, as cheating, but we have to live with, uh, with the fact that this is simply the most successful scheme that, that there actually is. So how should we think about, how should we handle that as theor theoreticians? Um, there's some examples that I will come back to in more detail, namely automatic translation is no longer based on linguistic theory, but it is based on n-gram distributions. I will explain that in a moment because I want to return to that example later on. Again, it's a Google approach. So, but first some, some general points. What we are seeing here is a paradigm shift clearly from model-driven to data-driven approaches. And now, instead of precise physical models, we just have correlation patterns that, that, that we detect in the data. And of course, we have an abundance of data in, in all fields uh, based on, on many simultaneous tech technological developments. So now, from theoretical principles, how should we think about this? Of course, there is a naive picture that one often has in, sci in the sciences as a reality, and the reality then should be described by, by some theory. Of course, we know since Kant that the picture is not, not so simple, that we don't have any direct access to, 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 to the reality as such. And also, if you look at modern physics, if you look at quantum physics or so, they're also not trying to describe any reality. They have the S matrix, the scattering matrix, so you have a state at this point in time, then you record another state at some later point in time, and you don't know what, what happened in between, and in principle, you cannot really know what happened in between. That is what quantum physics tells us. So it's not so simple as that, but nevertheless, if you go to biology or so, molecular biology, then you assume you have the reality of the cell and you want to describe it by theoretical tools. But of course, now there's data in between, and so, both of these arrows now carry question marks. So what is the relation between the reality and the data that are recorded by the technical devices that, 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 that we have? This is partly opaque. And then how should we go from the data to the theory if we just have the data but no, no, access to, no direct access to any structure of the underlying reality? Again, this is opaque. And I want to discuss some of these aspects in more detail with you now. So we don't have any intuitive or direct access. Yeah. Typically in traditional science, we had some intuitive, intuitive grasp of, of, of what was happening there. If you looked at an animal or even at a cell, we, to a certain extent, we had some intuitive understanding of what was happening there. But now data are generated by technical devices which are very remote from our sensory experience. So we don't have this immediate access as humans to, uh, to the objects that we are studying any longer. Then, of course, the data come in huge volumes in varying formats of uneven quality and reliability. I will return to that point on a subsequent slide in a little more detail. But again, the overwhelming magnitude and all that of course, poses new challenges. And it seems that typically we neither have an explanatory nor a predictive theory within which we could interpret the, the data. The data are just, just there and we, we, we no longer have a theory. So is, that me, is science then becoming meaningless? Is this agnostic? Is this an unscientific approach? Many people claim so. Yeah, but. I want to take a more optimistic stance on this aspect and rather look at the opportunities that this provides and also <coughs> the challenges for, for science, particularly for mathematics. So as I already said, 
big data is characterized by a couple of properties. First of all, there's a sheer magnitude or volume. If you just think about these numbers, petabytes per day or even more, this is just, just mind-boggling, the, the magnitude or, or size that vastly exceeds our human, ca human capacities. Then the data types are very heterogeneous. The representation and the semantic interpretation is, 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 is varying, in particular also of varying quality, and they arrive, they arrive at an enormous speed, arrival rate, and the reaction times that you have are typically extremely short, and you have to cope with, with, with that. So you can't really analyze in detail, you have to do something immediately with, with them. And then, of course, this leads to a already a complicated number of steps, which, which I have listed here. These are how the computer scientists or the, the big data people now describe the different phases of the data analysis pipeline. Uh, I don't want to go into all the details here. I just want to point out that by itself this is already a highly structured and complicated process. So now we then have certain scaling problems coming from the variety and, and, and the velocity with which they arrive, and the question is, how is that shown in, in the various sciences? In mathematics, we traditionally didn't pay very much attention to, uh, to that, to, to size or scaling or so. Of course, there is a difference between low and high dimensional geometric effects. I'll return a little to, to that later on, but as I said, we didn't really address that problem. In computer science, of course, you have problem of exponential explosion, this uh, NP hard problems, and so on, so theoretical computer science tried to address that in terms of complexity concepts, computational complexity. In physics or astronomy, this is daily life. If you look at the Large Hadron Collider, that is the machine that is operating at CERN in Geneva, which, for example, discovered the, the, the Higgs boson a few years ago, has to cope with the fact that you have incredible huge amounts of data in which you need to find these extremely rare, rare events, these, uh, these uh, particle decay events or so that, that, that you want to detect. And so they need to develop all kinds of statistical tools, mechanisms, schemes or so to, is to extract what, what they want out, out of the data. It's not just that the X boson is there, you can just observe it under a kind of microscope or so, it's nicely there. Its existence is inferred in a very indirect manner from among a huge pile of data, all, all kinds of, of recording, scattering, uh, collision experiments and, and so on. Again, this has to go through four or five stages, similar to the data analysis pipeline, until you come up with the confidence of maybe 99.9% .9 or even higher that actually the Higgs boson had been, been there. This is only very indirect. Likewise, with a slow and digital sky survey, it just produces enormous amounts of data by systematically recording every, every signal that, that, that you can get from the sky. But the advantage is here that we have la large but relatively well-structured data which have a clear interpretation, at, at least in particle physics. Whether that is correct or not is another matter, but at least there's a clear interpretation and it's just a challenge of detecting patterns. If you come to molecular biology, the situation is a little different. You have these, all these omics data, yeah? genomics, proteomics, and, and, and so on. These are generated by high throughput screening, but they are inherently noisy in the first place. And secondly, they cannot be so easily integrated with the biochemical knowledge that you have about specific reactions and, and, and pathways. So a traditional molecular biologist looked for years at a specific pathway or specific molecule in the cell or substructure of the cell, investigated all its particular properties, and now comes, come these, these high throughput, noisy data, and the molecular, traditional molecular biologist doesn't, doesn't know what, what to do with them, what, what is the meaning of them. 
Now, how should we cope with this? Ad? In neurobiology, it's somewhat similar. We have all these kinds of imaging data that are generated by very specialized technologies. Uh, you, you are put into a certain, certain screen, subjected to a high magnetic field and, and, and whatever, and then you measure your blood oxygen flow and then all these things. But again, these imaging data, which are in some sense of, of high quality, they give you good uh, spatial resolution, for instance, they cannot be integrated with the lower level knowledge that has been acquired about how single cells behave, we call the Hodgkin-Huxley, dynamics that I mentioned earlier, or this behavior of small groups of neurons that can also be studied, that can be probed with electrodes these days, so you can have simultaneous recordings from 10 or 100 elect uh, neurons at the same time with some electrode, but it's uh, completely unclear how that relates to this imaging data that you generate by these uh, by this new technical devices. And also, there are severe problems of data analysis and, and aggregation at the technical level, actually. And we are talking to, to, to some people in, in the field about some of these, about these questions. In the social sciences, it looks a little better because now you also have lots of data, big data. But there is some, of course, some history, some considerable history of modeling human interactions, for example, in terms of networks and, and correlations that started in the 1960s and 1970s. And the social scientists were some of the people that took network analysis also seriously, were among the first people to, to seriously analyze empirical networks. And to a certain extent, there is some conceptual framework into which large-scale data from social networks or behavioral patterns that, for example, you get from tracing mobile phone users can, can be integrated. So in the social sciences, it looks a little better than in neurobiology or in molecular biology, but if you're, socials, if you're a social scientist, of course, you're also aware of, of many problems there. But now let's look at one example in more detail, namely language processing. So what's, what is happening here? So linguistic theory developed since the 19th century. And one culmination for many people is, is the work of, of Chomsky, for instance. And linguistic theory in whatever variant or framework is essentially based on, on oppositions. You only have on one hand, you have the lang, the abstract system of a language. There's the parole, there's a concrete utterance. That is the basic opposition of de Saussure, who started much of linguistic theory in the late 19th century. Or Chomsky phrases it a little differently. You have the competence, and the ability for the correct syntax of your native language. If I give you a sentence in your native language in Danish, you can, can tell me whether that is grammatically correct or, or not. And then there is a performance in the actual production of utterances, which sometimes is faulty. Not all the sentences that you say in everyday, everyday speech are, are grammatically completely correct. There are other oppositions, namely language studies across time, how language evolves over the centuries, or that is the diachronous one or the synchronous one, the simultaneous one, the distribution, the, the current distribution and the current structure of the language. Or there's another opposition, again due to Chomsky, between the deep structure and the surface structure. So Chomsky thinks of language in such a way that on one hand you have a deep structure, that you have an abstract structure of kind of what, what, what you want to say, which is independent of the particular language that you employ. That is a deep structure. And then there's a mental process transforming that into an utterance in your own language according to the syntactic and, and, and other linguistic rules of your language. And the letter is in the surface structure, what comes out. And Chomsky was interested in these transformations and according to him, this transformation 
obeys the rules of what he called universal grammar, uh, universal structural rules that guide and channel this, this transformation. This is theoretically, of course, quite elaborate. Also, sometimes a distinction is made between spoken and written language. De Saussure, in particular Derrida, took that up recently, which is maybe not as, as deep as the distinction between the deep structure and the surface structure of Chomsky, but that is another opposition that we see in linguistic theory. Still looking a little closer into what is happening, Again, going back to De Saussure, we have, on one hand, paradigmatic alternatives. So if you have a sentence and you have a given position there and you need to fill, it, fill that in by a word and you can choose among uh, several ones. So you can choose house building or so as, as alternatives to fill in a particular position or you can look people, folks, and whatever to fill in a particular position according what, what suits you best. But the position is already there, and then you just have the alternatives which words to put into that position. And then you have the syntagmatic series, namely the relations between the different words in a single sentence. Well, that is the syntax. And there's also the opposition between absence and presence, because you choose one alternative, that is present, the others are absent. Or you have selection. You can choose what to put in a position, and you have constraints. You have the grammatical rules that the string of words needs to satisfy. And so, again, one is thinking in terms of oppositions. So that is the structure of linguistic theory. And so, ideally, while these oppositions are formal, more or less, they are not directly mathematical, but ideally they, sh they should guide then all the process of translation. When you have these oppositions, you develop a formal theory of language. You can perhaps utilize that for automatic translation. And by automatically inferring the grammatical relationships within a given sentence, so you have a pronoun, then you sort of need to have rules to figure out automatically to which other constituent in the sentence the pronoun refers. Yeah, what's the mean, what's the relation of the an anaphora, what's the reference of anaphora are and, and so on. And then when you have analyzed all that, you can transform that into the corresponding structure of another language with the help of a lexicon. And you correlate meanings of the individual words. That is how, according to theory, translation should, should go. But somehow it doesn't work that, that way. In big data automatic translation, we don't have all these oppositions. We just have a single basic element that is a corpus, which scales by size. Yeah? And so we don't have competence and performance, yeah? the, the high scale and the low scale. We just have some, some, uh, some, some flexible scaling ac according to size. We no longer have the opposition. The extremes are bridged. A small corpus then corresponds to the parole of the Saussure, the performance of Chomsky, and the big corpus, large lexicon or large database, corresponds to the lung or the, or the competence. So the opposition is gone. Li likewise, the other oppositions. So the collections of linguistic data, which may be possibly huge, so that is the advantage of, of big machine approaches, are all that, 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 that there is, nothing else. So this looks like a loss of theoretical insight, but it's not that simple. You only have two criteria, namely what is digitally available and what, what you can handle computationally. And there's only one single difference, namely what you can do online directly and what, what, what you have to do offline. But there are never, nevertheless mathematical concepts involved there. You no longer have this opposition between paradigma or syntagmata, as I explained from De Saussure, but instead you have the mathematical concepts of stochastic processes and the mathematical concept of Shannon information. So the point is that De Saussure's alternatives were not quantitative, they were just qualitative. We have several possibilities, 
but now you want to make them quantitative. So if you have several probabilities, you not want, uh, don't just want to have these probabilities, you want to have their uh, possibilities, you want to have their probabilities, how likely they are actually occurring. Yeah? And so that is where information theory comes in. It quantifies the probabilities of different words to occur at such a position in the sentence, but not just abstractly, but depending on the concrete word before and behind it. So you not only have probabilities for the occurrence of a word at a given position, but the important thing is you have the transition probabilities from a segment of a few words to the next. So you have seen a few words, and then you ask what, with what probability that particular word could come in next. Yeah? And so these are the mathematical concepts. They're different. They're different formal concepts, and they're more, more mathematical than what linguistic theory had provided. But apart from that, the big data approach to automatic translation does not care about an underlying conceptual structure, but just seeks mathematical structures that can replace the qualitative oppositions by quantitative probabilities. And that is, in a nutshell, what is happening. And I think this is a good example to also understand, perhaps, the transition going on in, in other fields. So what counts are the relative frequencies of pentagrams. So pentagrams are groups of five, five words. That is what one is working with in practice, and that is what also accounts for, for many of the limitations. So if you try to automatically translate a sentence with Google Translate, often your nonsense comes, comes out. And that is just because this by itself for computational limitations cannot really take long-range dependencies into account. But when the computational power increases, I guess you can go further, and then you can expect that the quality <coughs> of the translation increases. And so these frequencies of pentagrams, or the, the probabilities, are automatically computed from large corpora. You don't ask a linguist. In fact, at Google, one says, uh, whenever we fire a linguist, our performance increases by, by 5%. <laughs> And everything is done automatically. You just need a big, big enough corpus to have good estimates of this, um, uh, to have uh, many, many uh, enough such pentagrams in order to be able to estimate their probabilities in the different languages. And then you need to correlate them across languages. So in some sense, this asks more precise questions than formal linguistics. You not just ask what could come next, but you rather ask, how well can I guess what comes, comes next? Yeah, and that is quantified by information theory. And central issues that have been discussed, hotly debated, hotly by linguists, are simply bypassed. I mean, what is the relation between syntax and semantics, between the formal structure and the meaning? Uh, uh, automatic translation doesn't care about that. So a human translator first tries to extract the meaning of a text and then attempts to express that meaning in the other language, the target language. Whereas an automatic translation simply transforms one structure into the other. Well, let's look at some example just to, 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 to have a little fun where probably automatic translation also has some, some difficulties. So you have this sentence here. And then you compare it with that one over here. And then you try it. Uh, I, I guess you, you understand what is, what is happening here. And then in, as a test, you could uh, give it to, to, to Google Translate and see what comes out. <laughs> so, but now let's come back to the topic. What can mathematics contribute here? Is that good or bad for mathematics? So we have seen a shift towards data-driven research. And the claim is, which is relatively obvious, that this requires now formal methods and tool, tools that are more abstract than those required for model-driven research, because it should be domain-independent. <coughs> the data don't really care where they come from. And the mathematician doesn't know where the data are coming from. So we need more abstract methods and tools here. 
And this is a challenge, but also an opportunity for mathematics to address that problem. So I will give you some examples of what mathematics could contribute and what, what are the issues there. So there are some traditional methods. You apply linear algebra methods, uh, principal component analysis, singular value decomposition, and all that. You have to fight the curse of dimensionality. That's the number of possibilities. Explodes exponentially with the number of dimensions or degrees of freedom that, that you have. You use statistical tools, sometimes implicit, like neural networks, to find correlation patterns. Again, that is an aspect to which I will return in more depth in a moment because that offers interesting aspects in itself. And one could also search for low dimensional structures, the, the structures that are more easily grasped in high dimensional spaces. And there are some, some methods called manifold learning or compressed sensing. Again, I will return in a little more detail to, 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 to some of this. So mathematicians are facing and seeing that challenge and trying to, to respond to it. And in particular, at a more abstract level, one also starts to investigate more seriously, seriously the topology and geometry of high dimensional structures. For many decades, mathematicians have concentrated either on low dimensional structures. Perhaps you have heard about the solution of the Poincare conjecture a couple of years ago, which was about the structure of three dimensional objects. And then we know a lot about Hilbert spaces, infinite dimensional objects, but we know comparatively less about finite dimensional but high dimensional structures. What is typically uh, typical about geometry in a thousand or in a million dimensions or so? To what extent is that different from three or four dimensional geometry? So therefore we definitely need new methods that are adequate both conceptually, that's why we need to look at high dimensional spaces and computationally. That is why, for example, we need to address the curse of dimensionality for the analysis of such high dimensional structures and in particular, how to identify quickly and reliably the patterns within them, which a priori we, we don't really know. And that is essentially what I will address now in, in the remaining few minutes. But this requires novel combinations of machine learning, of high dimensional statistics, and of geometry. And that is one direction in which mathematics is, is, is likely to move also in the near future. Not all of mathematics, but that is likely to be one of the foci of, of mathematical research in the decades to, to come. So, but let's again try to understand it from a more abstract level. So nowadays, everything is Bayesian. So whatever, whatever you do is Bayesian statistics. That has something to do with the really availability of the corresponding computational resources. But conceptually, you begin the process of scientific inquiry with prior hypo hypotheses that are constructed by us which then, according to Bayesian scheme, are transformed into posterior ones on the basis of the observations that you have made of the data that you have acquired. And models then only pro provide sets of parameters that have to be fitted to the data, which, of course, is in contrast to what <coughs> physicists like to do. An ideal physical model should contain only very few parameters that, uh, that you have to measure. And the more three parameters that are not determined by a theory are contained in the model, the less it is liked by, by, by the physicists. And now, of course, physicists face a problem that the standard model of elementary particle physics, which embodies all the knowledge that, that you actually have, and which is empirically quite, quite, quite successful, recall the discovery of the, of the Higgs boson, nevertheless contains quite a lot of many parameters and people don't know where they are coming from. And so one is searching for more basic models which explain or eliminate some of these parameters. But of course, the data-driven approach doesn't help you there. You get more and more parameters. 
the problem is that if you have a model with many free parameters that you have to fit to the data, you can no longer count on empirical adequacy as a proof of the correctness of the models because with many parameters you can basically fit everything. So you need <coughs> other criteria. But which, which are those? But the problem is then there is no longer such a thing as, as a correct model. If you just have uh, many parameterizations, of course, you can fit the parameters from different per perspectives or different set of parameters that uh, may have the same predictive or even explanatory value. And so you need other criteria. What, what are they? Traditionally, you would think about simplicity of the model, symmetry, or beauty, or whatever. But are they really adequate when, when you are when you're dealing with big data? Not clear. But this is a fact that you have to face, that physicists will have to face, that there certainly is no longer such a thing as a correct model <coughs> in the situation of data-driven research. So the only thing that we can do is to seek regularities in the data on the basis of certain structural hypotheses, like sparsity that need not necessarily come from the data and that may not come from the data, but that are applied by us to get some handle on, on the data. So the humans come in again. And so, in other words, I will elaborate on that point a little. We need to make some structural prior assumptions about what could be contained in the data, what could be the structure in the data that you will not update according to Bayesian scheme, but that you will stick with. So this may sound rather agnostic, but in practice, of course, this is often quite quite su successful. I mean, big data analysis has, many, has led to, to many successes and insights and, and whatever. Just working with those schemes of Bayesian update, parameter fitting, and structural hypothesis, which are all, in a certain sense, dubious from a, from a general conceptual or philosophical perspective. But it is a challenge for mathematics to analyze this issue theoretically, you know, what, what, what you can do in abstract terms in this, in this data analysis. And so in epistemic terms, data analysis depends on certain prior structural assumptions. You have a Bayesian prior, you have, fam you have a family of models as in parameter parametric statistics, that is your determine the parameters that, that you need to fit a priori, and you have general structural hypothesis like sparsity, intrinsically low dimensional structure, and often you like to have invariances or symmetries. Symmetries are beautiful and you like to see them in the data. But the ontological question is, is there anything underlying the data that match those assumptions? Because these assumptions that you, as a data analyst, uh, analyst are bringing to, to, to the data, they may not have any independent justification. But nevertheless, they are often successful. So what is happening here? And then coming back to the original examples, are those instances like Newton's theory of planar, planetary motion, the Schrödinger equation, the biological reaction kinetics, the Hodgkin-Huxley equations, or the traffic dynamics, all the examples that I've cited in the, in the beginning, are these just lucky coincidences? Or are there more systematic structural aspects of reality, whatever that is, whatever reality is, that make our speculations sometimes so successful? But let's final few minutes look a little more into the schemes what we as mathematicians already can do. So as I already said, we make certain structural prior assumptions to handle the, the data, to, to reduce the variability, the volume, and so on. So first of all, we assume that maybe there are only a few dominant degrees of freedom. The rest doesn't really matter. And so there are methods to identify them, principal and independent component analysis among the foremost ones then we assume that intrinsically things are continuous, they're smooth and, and regular. This is something that was brought up by Leibniz already, his principle of continuity, 
and still it is uh, often very successful structural prior that you assume that what is happening is, is smooth and regular and not wild and discontinuous and jumpy. And you assume that things maybe are intrinsically low dimensional. This is a method of, of manifold learning. You're in high dimensional space, but the actual distribution of data may be intrinsically only quite low dimensional. Again, that is a structural assumption that you make, perhaps without much justification, but which often is successful. I already mentioned symmetries and invariances, which of course, again, reduce the complexity. Then often you assume that you have decompositions, hierarchical structures, the mathematical term is tensor decompositions. Then you assume maybe that you have few sources in auditory scene or so, you have all these complicated sound patterns, but you assume that you have only few sources. You don't assume anything more but then you're in the business of compressed sensing and you can get quite far analyzing an auditory scene. And so the question is, are these just heuristic devices without a deeper justification or are they cognitive tricks that we apply like the Gestalt laws that we always use to analyze visual scenes for, for pattern recognition or are they intrinsic features of reality? This is probably the answer is, is, is somewhere in between. None of these alternatives uh, holds purely. But what we need is a higher level of abstraction which is domain unspecific because all these things that I have mentioned here have nothing to do with any particular domain. They're just abstract formal, formal prior structures, patterns. But it gets even worse if we no longer understand the data analysis and prediction tools themselves. So here at the end I want to cite the example of so-called deep neural networks, which have been spectacularly successful in recent years. They take their inspiration from the structure of the mammalian cortex, in particular the human cortex, which has six layers, but then they exaggerate. They not only confine themselves to six layers, they work with hundreds, several hundreds of layers. The more layers you have, uh, typically, the better the performance. And they operate from one layer to layer in a directed feedforward manner. They just have an initial layer, and then they, uh, they propagate things from, from one layer to the next, but uh, there is no, no feedback or rec recurrence. <coughs> and in particular, while they take some inspiration from how our brain works, they ignore other features because our brain operates a lot with recurrency feedback and, and all that. Uh, they have synchronized oscillations in our brain. Temporal delays uh, are, are quite important for computation aspects. All that is ignored there. But the problem rather is that the details of the working and why they perform so much better than other types of computational architecture. They have the same number of neurons and if you don't organize them in layers, but according to some different architecture, the performance is, is by no means is so, so good. We don't really understand why. I mean, we, we are working towards it that is not completely this, uh, out of reach, but currently we don't understand why. But nevertheless, they currently constitute, constitute one of the most advanced and powerful tools of data analysis. But we don't understand really how, how it operates. Yeah, for example, you perhaps you saw about this feat of beating the, the Go champion in the world that was essentially done by, by deep neural network architecture. And so the state is that we not only do not understand the details of the data generation, but we may also be ignorant of, about how they are analyzed with the tools that we have created. And perhaps this is a little worrisome that we are faced with that situation. But let's draw our consequences. So we, instead of causal structures as a traditional theoretical model provided us with, however correctly or not is not the question here, we only have correlations. And we need to make our predictions on the basis of systematic correlations. So we identify the correlations and speculate that they will persist. That, that are our predictions as opposed to, to a deeper theoretical approach. And what are we explaining then? And then 
the opportunity and the challenge for mathematics is to become an abstract science of data structure. So there are many problems there at which I've hinted, and it's a challenge to investigate those abstractly and systematically. And perhaps this is good for mathematics because it could bring it closer to its dream of a pure structural science which is abstract and independent of any specific content. Well, why, why bother about the physicists or so with, uh, with their particle models? Uh, these are unnecessary constraints for us. We, we just want to have abstract, pure structural science. And then in the area of big data, mathematics no longer is a maiden or the tool of science, but it becomes a science of, of formal tools. And so that is a positive and optimistic outlook that I take as a mathematician here. Thank you for your attention.